Amen. It's good. It's good because in the church setting like this, I don't, you know, the Lord has us as his children. So it's okay if we have uh, children helping us out in the service, like working the board in the back for the sound and everything. Thank you, Andrew, for helping with the sound. All right, we're continuing this morning, this Sunday morning, in our studies in the Gospel according to St. John. We began last week, and we looked at the introduction to John's Gospel, and we saw how this is a very unique Gospel, and that uh, John was chosen by God to write this Gospel uh, long after the other three Gospels were written, maybe 30 to 40 years after Matthew and Mark and Luke had taken pen under the inspiration of God to write the synoptic gospels that look at Jesus from a ground level. John is given the bird's eye view of Jesus Christ. And we looked at that introduction last week and we just were beginning to get in to the first verse. <clears throat> so why don't we go back and we'll read the first few verses and then we'll continue and make comments on them as the Lord uh, guides us in his word. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now we notice right away, John starts with the same words that begin the, the Bible, in the beginning. And then, of course, the Bible begins in the beginning, God. And here, in the beginning, was the Word. And he, he uses this, the Word. We're going to find it. John is going to repeat a lot of sevens as he goes through in his teaching. There are going to be seven terms that he's going to use in the first chapter to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to paint a portrait of him as God, the Son of God. God has arrived. God is here. And the first term he's going to use to describe him is the Word. The Word. And that's with a, a capital W. Now, you, we're going to find this particular term penned seven times in the Holy Bible. And all seven times it will be by the Apostle John through this Gospel and his epistles and the book of Revelation. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. But the first thing John wants to do is he, he just states it quickly in that first sentence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's back in the beginning. And the Word was God. Right away, he brings forth the Word three times in one verse. Okay? So here he goes. Remember, in the New Testament, God is going to reveal the Godhead. He's going to reveal the fact of three persons in one. And so here in the very first verse, here comes one, two, three mentions in the first verse of the Word because he's bringing forth the, the concept of the Godhead. He's going to fill this in and we'll, we'll see by the end of today's message. But he's bringing it forth and he's, he's telling us the Word was God. The first thing he wants to establish about the Word is that it's the eternal Word. He tells you the Word was God. It was in the beginning, and the Word was God. He's bringing forth now the deity of the Word. He's going to introduce this term, the Word, then he's going to bring forth the fact that this, this term represents God. And so like we saw last week, we could actually substitute the Word in places in the Bible where we see God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, the Word created the heaven and the earth. This is the eternal Word. Now, I'll show you... Um, the Word was God in the beginning. Somebody might think, okay, so in the beginning, of course we know God, He comes out of eternity, and in the beginning the Word was there with Him, but maybe the Word was something that uh, God brought forth in the beginning. But He's going to show you that the very person He's speaking about, of course He tells you later on in verse 14, the Word was made flesh. There's the next time He uses the Word with a capital W. That's the fourth time we'll see it in this chapter. And the Word was made flesh. Now we know who that was. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling you the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ, the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word. And the Word was with God in the beginning. Okay, was the Word created by God right at the beginning? Or was the Word from before the beginning? Well, John again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit building upon what's already been written in the Scriptures, in order to get the, the proper building frame, you'd have to go back to the book of Micah, chapter 5. Go a few books to the left. When you get to the Matthew, 
at, at the New Testament, you go back a few books before that, you know, Malachi and Zechariah and Nahum, and you go back and you'll come across a small book called Micah, one of the minor prophets, the sixth minor prophet writing toward the end of the Old Testament. Micah chapter 5. John's establishing that the Word is, was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Word. How about Jesus Christ? Was He created at the beginning? with God and then, then to be with Him? Well, in, in Micah chapter 5 <clears throat> and verse 2, a famous verse, But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, there were two Bethlehems, so he's just letting you know which Bethlehem. It's not the Bethlehem up in Naphtali, it's the southern Bethlehem and Ephratah by Judah. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. He that is to be the ruler in Israel, he whose goings have been, uh, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting, from everlasting. So who's going to come forth? Who's going to be born in Bethlehem? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, and 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 the Bible. God's telling the prophet Micah, the one that's going to come forth to me from Bethlehem, the one that's going to come forth to me and do all the work from Bethlehem, the one that's going to make a way to get back to me. That one, his goings have been from everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, eternal. This is the eternal word. This is the eternal word. As we line up John's gospel with Micah 5.2. Knowing that we're speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ from everlasting to everlasting. That's, it, it's a bit much for my mind. We were talking about this when we were in the book of Genesis. Because the book of Isaiah says that I am the Lord Almighty and God inhabiteth eternity. Now eternity is, is hard for our limited minds to comprehend because we're talking about something that is without the boundaries of space and outside of the boundaries of time. And so as we looked at it back in, in Genesis, we, we considered in the beginning what God began to create was an island within the midst of eternity. And that island that it created is a universe bounded by space and time. And that's when the beginning of time started. And in the beginning, here comes God out of eternity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and they, in the beginning, boom, they create this island of space and time that you and I float on. Now someday we're going to get to be lifted off this island of space and time and placed into eternity with our God. That's going to be a blessing. But right now we're bounded by space and by time. The astronauts have found that. They can only go so far. They keep finding themselves bounded. They, they look out the Hubble telescope and they find boundaries to the universe. And they're surprised. that they, they even estimated the size of it. I think they said it's 10 to the 27th uh, meters. They estimated the width of the universe. There seems to be bounds to it, which kind of perplexes them. And then and it kind of fries their brains, too. And they, don't, they can't figure out what's on the other side of it. Well, eternity's on the other side of it. There is an island of space and time on which we're in. And, and out of eternity, from everlasting, here came the Word. Here comes God beginning this thing. Do I understand it? No. Do I believe it? You, yeah, I believe it. I mean, what's the alternative? <laughs> Ask the scientists, what's the alternative? It takes more faith to believe the crazy things they come up with than what God says right here. There is a creature, God, a creator, actually, that is just beyond our understanding. He's a creator. And uh, he always was, and he always will be. And he's in eternity. And it's just, it's hard for us to understand. And, and John is beginning to lay this concept right down here that this Jesus Christ is that creator God from everlasting that came down. I mean, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. He's the eternal word. And then not only is this, verse 3, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Not only is he the eternal word, He's the creator word, or the creative word. He made and created things. How many things? Everything. Not anything that was made, was made without Him. Now this, this is amazing. And, but this is the way God works. And this, this thought of Him being the creator word is reiterated throughout the New Testament. There are a number of scriptures that we could turn to. I want to take a look at uh, maybe two of them. 
turn to the right of John a number of books to a small epistle called Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now we, we all knew that God created the heaven and the earth. But what he's bringing forth now to us is not only did God create the heaven and the earth, the, Jesus Christ created the heaven and the earth. Jesus Christ made all things. He's the, create, the creative word. He's the creator God. And this is what he wants to lay down for us. Now, the book of Colossians is a great little book sometime. When you read these little books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're great little books. Each have a, a particular theme. The theme in here is it's the glory and the work and the person of Jesus Christ. This book really focuses on the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And in this particular book in chapter 1 and verse 16, it tells us this about him. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So he, we learn that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the Creator God. Jesus created things. Now, again, sometimes we get confused because he took the time to step out of eternity and, and walk on, on our planet within space and time, and he bounded himself by space and time from, you know, B.C. A.D. to 33 A.D. Because he was here for that short, we think, well, well, that's when he began. And, and John's putting this to rest. He's saying, no, he's from everlasting. He was in the beginning, and he created all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. These are the points that John wants to bring across to us. Matter of fact, a little later on, after Colossians, there's a book called Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. And in Hebrews chapter 1, Now we understand. Now why is John using this term, the word? Hebrews chapter 1 helps to fill us in on this a little bit in the first two verses. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times, that would be like various times, and in diverse manners, put an E at the end of that, diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So Paul's talking to the Jewish people. He's saying, you remember, in the old days, God spoke through the prophet Abraham and through the prophet Moses, and, and he spoke through the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Elijah. Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Here you go. The Word. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is going to come, and he's going to give us the thoughts and the, the intents and the love and the heart of God, the Word. He's going to give us the final Word from God. Can we still look at the Old Testament? Of course we can. Can we still get good things? Well, of course we can because it's written for our example so we can learn things. But we want the final Word on God's heart on a matter? Go to the Word. He's spoken by the Word. So the, the, he, John gives us the term, the Word, to let it to under, for us to understand and realize that God wants to speak to us. And he felt the best way he could speak to us was by the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is the preeminent word. This is how God's speaking nowadays. If somebody wants to know what are, what are God's thoughts, well, listen to Jesus. And you know a good way to do that? The Gospel of John, which is why we're studying it. Because we're going to learn some wonderful things about what Jesus not only did, but what he thinks as he goes through the seven miracles in this gospel, and Jesus explains every miracle to us and why he did them. And the Word is going to speak to us. And it's through this very book that we're going to read, the Gospel of John, that the Word will speak to our hearts. I believe more people will get saved reading the Gospel of John than anywhere else. I know I got saved, and I hear that testimony over and over. God's going to speak by his Son. But notice also in the rest of verse 2, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. There it is, the Creator, the Son. The Son did the creating. The Son did the work. I think about the house that I live in. I live in a house that was built by a father and son building team. The father had been a good builder for many, many years, had built many, many homes, and he was getting on in years. And his son was young and strong and in his you know, 20s and 30s. And now what would happen was the, they would get together on a project and the father would do a lot of the thinking up of what should be done and a lot of the planning, but the son would go forth and do the actual labor and do the building. And so here God, I'm sure God was involved in the creative thoughts 
but he used his son to do all the creative acts. And so the Lord Jesus Christ made all things. The Lord, it says right here, he made the worlds. Which worlds? The, the physical world and the spirit world. That's what it was referring to in Colossians. Thrones, dominions, principalities, things invisible, things unseen. The spirit world was also made by Jesus Christ. He was the creator of all the angelic host. He's the one that created Michael and Gabriel and the cherubs and Lucifer. Lucifer is a creature. The Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. The gap between them is larger than the gap at the Grand Canyon. There's no comparison between them. Some people think there's this battle going on between Jesus and Lucifer. There is, but it's no match. Jesus is just holding back in grace right now. When the day comes for judgment, it's, you know, it's no match. It'd be like putting Hulk Hogan in there with a six-year-old child. And even that can't even begin to appreciate how much greater Jesus is than Lucifer. He created him. He created him. I mean, there's, there's a battle going on down here, but when Jesus puts it to rest, he's going to put it to rest. As we read in the book of Revelation, he created all things. He's the creative word. Now the question is, I wonder, how did he do it? How exactly did he make all this stuff around us? It says, without him was not anything made. You mean this artificial tree right here was made by Jesus? That's what the book just said. Well, well how did he do that? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Some human being did it. And you know how, where that human being got his life from? From Jesus Christ. Jesus made that spirit, made that soul. And through the creative acts that he did originally, made the dust that made up that human being. And Jesus Christ holds that breath in, in that person and allows him to live. So uh, Jesus' signature on this too. Jesus has made everything. But how did he make all this matter all around us? Well, go to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Psalm 33, we'll look at two verses, verse 6 and verse 9. <clears throat> now it tells you in verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now it's interesting. I would almost want that to be by the word with a capital W because by the word of the Lord, by Jesus, all things were made. But notice it's with a small w. So the word, the creative word here with the capital W emanated a spoken word and this spoken word brought forth the things that were made, brought forth, if you will, the heavens and the earth. They were all made. How do I know that? Well, look at verse 9. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So he spoke the worlds into existence. Now, this is a mind blower, especially if you study science. You know one of the great equations that came out of science in the last hundred years was, was by Albert Einstein. You ever seen, what's the famous equation of Albert Einstein? Anybody know it? E equals mc squared. E equals mc squared. You know what that equation stands for? It's interesting. E, energy, equals, m stands for mass or matter. The mass of a piece of matter, how much it ways, if you will, that close enough for understanding, times C is a constant for the speed of light. And not just the speed of light, the speed of light squared. Now that's, that's exceedingly fast. That, that is kind of mind-blowing if, if you know anything about the speed of light. I mean, I was thinking yesterday about that tragedy that happened with the Columbia. Did you hear how fast they were going when that thing happened? They were going 12,500 miles per hour, okay? I mean, that's faster than the 33 when there's no backup. I mean, 12,500 miles per hour. Okay, now I was in a plane recently. We we're doing about five to 600 miles per hour. 12,500 miles per hour, that's 20, uh, 20 to 21 times faster than the speed of sound. I and mean, we can't even comprehend that. I mean, what you saw them 
yesterday, unfortunately, was them burning up as they re-entered the atmosphere. They're going 12,000 miles an hour, and they hit the atmosphere, and they just kind of burned up. 12,000 miles per hour, very, very fast for us to understand. I mean, we they take you around the globe in an hour, no, two hours, you go around the globe. So you could fly from here to uh, Israel in one hour at that speed. In one hour, they go from here to Israel. Now, if, you, if anyone's ever making a trip to the Holy Land, it's usually 24 hours of airtime for us to do it. And they could do it in one hour. The speed of light <coughs> is 186,000 miles, not per hour, per second. 186,000 miles per second. That make that rocket ship yesterday look like it was standing still. The speed of light goes around the Earth not once every two hours, it goes around seven times every second. I don't know how many times it is an hour, someone do the math. It goes seven times around the earth in a second. The speed of light squared is 186,000 miles a second times 186,000 miles a second. That's a big number. And when, when Einstein came up with this equation, what they figured out was that a little bit of matter can make a lot of bit of energy. And, and um, they, they experimented on it and came up with something called a, 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 an atomic bomb. And the bomb that blew up Hiroshima weighed about as much as I did, about 70 kilograms. So the bomb was 70 kilograms. Have you ever seen the, the mushroom cloud that came out of that bomb and the damage that it did? That 70 kilogram bomb, 70 kilograms. 70 kg, okay. Let off was 15 kilotons, which would be 30, which would be the same as 30 million pounds of energy. Now, interestingly, scientists down here have noticed that man can only take the equation in this direction. Man can take some kind of mass, some kind of matter, and convert it to some kind of energy. We do it all the time. Put gasoline in your car, you're taking some kind of matter, some kind of mass, and after a while there's no gas in the car. Why? It was converted to energy. There was heat energy, and there was the energy, the kinetic energy to drive the car. You do it when you light a log in the fireplace. You take this thing, it's got so much mass in it. Now, there are chemical reactions rather than nuclear, but there's a lot of power in there, potentially, but you take that log in there, and you light that log, and over time heat energy is given, the nice radiant heat energy, and at the time uh, there's less matter, the ashes, but energy has been given off. But man can only take the, the equation in this direction. Because you're going from matter to energy, and energy is kind of a spiritual thing. And man has never been able to take anything spiritual and turn it into matter. Never has and never will be. That's what Jesus did. God is a spirit. He spoke words which are spiritual, which have energy in them. When I speak, the words coming out of my mouth are moving the air mass around you and the energy is moving your eardrum and tickling the, the little bones on the inside and you're hearing what I'm saying and I'm using spiritual things to communicate with you and that's and God spake and he drove the equation in this direction. Only God could do that. And then I started thinking about the significance of that thing. Remember, I told you, a little tiny 70 kilograms led to that big mushroom cloud, you know, that they got. And that, that big mushroom cloud just saw the thing just blew up over there. Little tiny 70 kilograms. Now, God had to go in the opposite direction. In other words, to make 70 kilograms, he had to use a mushroom cloud worth of energy to make 70 kilograms. He didn't speak 70 kilograms into existence. He spoke the entire planet and all the other planets into existence, how much energy emanated from him. Think of the power of God's word. That's the word of God. That's, that's mind-numbing. You just think about that for a while. It's like mushroom clouds going in reverse, making energy. And he did that to speak the planet and Jupiter and Saturn and the stars and the entire universe into existence. How much power is contained in our God? Our God is an awesome God. <laughs> when you start thinking of the math 
and the equations and putting that down. Our God is an awesome God. His word has power. As a matter of fact, turn to Luke chapter 4. He spake and it was done. He spake and it stood fast. He commanded and there were the worlds. Go to Luke chapter 4. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching. And in Luke chapter 4, and sometimes we say things and we don't realize what we're saying. And verse 32, Luke 4, 32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And let me tell you, they and we haven't figured out the half of it. The half hasn't been told. We're just beginning to get a grasp. His word was with power. Verse 36, And they were all amazed, and they spake among themselves, What a word is this! Exclamation point. For with authority and power, he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. You better believe it. He made the worlds, the spirit world and the physical world. Jesus Christ can do anything he wants just by speaking. He's, he's the eternal word. He's the creative word. Not only that. Continue. On in John 1. <laughs> you know, I got, a, I got a tape one of those history channels when they have like one of those uh, little boy picture, the, the mushroom cloud, and just do it in reverse a few times and just watch it go backwards and just think about that. Because that, that's just him speaking. <laughs> and just speaking things into existence. Unbelievable. Just amazing. Just, I mean, I believe it, but I mean, it's just my little mind short circuits. Not only is he the, the, the eternal word, <coughs> not only is he the, the creative word, but when we get down to verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh. <laughs> think about all that power inside that human body. I mean, think, think, think of the power inside of that human body. Talk about meekness. I mean, meekness is strength under control. I mean, you imagine the power he had, what he could have done if he ever exercised any of what was inside of him in a harmful manner to anyone around him? The Word was made flesh. He's not only the, the eternal Word, he's not only the creative Word, the thing that's so incredible, the thing that, that separates Christianity from any other religion is he's the incarnate Word. That our God became man. He's the incarnate Word. The Word... The word this root carnal, carn is like, uh, you see the word carnival, which is a flesh fest. Carn is flesh. Chili con carne, that means chili with meat in it. You know, it's meat. It, flesh. He, he, he became flesh. The word was made flesh. Now, that, that's a real trick. I don't know how he did that, but he did it. He did it. That stumbles a lot of people, but John wants to introduce it right off the beginning to you. He, he doesn't want to waste any time. He wants you to... He says, this is it. God loved you so much and wanted to be like you that the Word was made flesh. I heard a story uh, many years ago about a farmer uh, in a cold January. And uh, he had a little cabin that he was in. And uh, he's cooking in the kitchen at about 5 o'clock. And he hears a noise, a rapping on the window. Uh, he had a door that had a window on it to enter into the kitchen from the outside and he hears a rapping on that window and he goes and he looks and there's a little sparrow out there trying to get in attracted by the light and the warmth and the heat and wanting to come in to be with him and of course as soon as he opened the door the thing was frightened and flew away because uh, birds are afraid of us and so it flew away and the farmer had compassion and wanted to help that little bird and um, he, he thought, okay, well, he's afraid of me, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll open the barn up and let him go in there. I'll, I'll make a, a nice warm thing in the barn. I'll leave the barn. I'll just leave it open for him. And so as he went in to prepare it, of course, the bird wouldn't go anywhere near it. And he tried all kinds of methods to try and attract the bird to come in, but the bird just wouldn't go because the bird could not comprehend that something so big and so powerful and scary would have its best interest at heart. And no matter how many different techniques he tried, he couldn't get that bird to go into that barn. The bird just had fear just like we often have with God. And he thought, if, you know, he said, if only I could become a sparrow, I could convince that bird and it would believe me. And I think that's how God was with us. And that's why the Word was made flesh. Because God realized that there's a fear of God that we have inside of us and it's hard to believe he'd have our best interest in heart. He's so big. He's so powerful. He's so awesome. How could he possibly have our best interest in heart? Well, he wanted you to know he, he came and became one of us and walked among us. That's how much he loved us. He did what the farmer couldn't do. 
the incarnate word that came down to walk with us. Now, Oh, through this, and over and over he's going to repeat the theme so you don't miss it. And I think part of the reason John wrote it, first and foremost, he just wants you to know the love of God for mankind. But secondly, by the time John was writing this gospel, there were a group of people that were uh, spreading uh, a theory in Israel. And they were spreading the theory, and the theory was, Remember, he wrote this about 90 A.D. So the Lord Jesus Christ had ascended back into heaven. It had been about 50-something years. And the other Gospels had been written. And other people who had testified and seen Jesus were going home to be with the Lord. And so now you're into the second, the third generation. And now this theory came forth called Gnosticism. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. The Gnostics, they were out there. These were a group of people that were denying certain things. The Gnostics. It comes from a Greek word, gnosis, is to know. And the Gnostics claim that they had this higher knowledge that nobody else had. And the knowledge they claimed was that, oh, yeah, sure, there's a God, and, and oh, yeah, and, and he cares about you, and, and oh, yeah, he was, he was here 30 years ago or whatever he was here, but, but he wasn't really in a body. They were apparitions. It was spirit projection. It was angelic visions. God was just working. God would never take on the form of flesh because flesh is sinful and flesh is wicked. And so this Gnostic theory came out that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was here, but it wasn't really in a body. That was just you thinking that. You were hallucinating. You were imagining that. Now, now John is going to, throughout this gospel that we're in, like in the fourth chapter, he'll tell us in, in the sixth verse that Jesus was wearied with a journey. He'll tell you in, in the next verse that he was thirsty one day. Uh, it tell you that he was hungry. He tells you in the 11th chapter that Jesus wept. He tells you in the 19th chapter that he bled. And he, he's going to go through and he's going to show us over and over and over. These are things associated with human beings. Jesus Christ is the God-man. And John wants to make this absolutely positively certain in our minds. He's going to bring forth the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and he will reiterate the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ to counter the Gnostic heresy that it was just some kind of spirit apparition. Jesus Christ, what, matter of fact, go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We'll take a look at two places. And then we'll finish it up with 1 John. I'll show you what John says in his epistle. But look at Philippians chapter 2. See, this heresy is out there. The Gnostics. This heresy is still around today. Not as strong as it was back then. Today, I have a different heresy today. Today, what they deny is that uh, Jesus was God. They'll admit he was a man. So, you know, the, the devil swings the pendulum to both extremes. Oh, yeah, he was God, but he wasn't a man. He had no flesh. Today, he was a man, but he wasn't God. He just swings the pendulum back and forth to two extremes. But back then, they were having the problems with, because nobody could deny the miracles. So, yeah, it must have been God at work, but not, not in the flesh. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This verse has changed in a lot of modern Bibles, but notice what it's saying here. Jesus was in the form of God. There he was, from everlasting to everlasting. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. No, he was not robbing. He was equal with God. He was God. In the beginning was the Word. Now, if any of us thought to be equal to God, we'd be robbing God of his glory. But not Jesus. He was full of glory, full of grace, full of truth. He was equal with God. But notice what he did. Verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He came with a body like you and I have. Now, he was made in the likeness of us. There was one difference between Jesus and you and me. We're sinners by nature. He was not. He was born in a body like ours, but without the sin nature in it. He was sinless from birth and lived a sinless life and eschewed and turned away from all temptations. But he had a body. This was not a spirit apparition. He was in the likeness of men. And let me show you verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. You know what I might have done if I were God? I might have come down as a full-grown adult man, giving you the word, 
and then zip back up on a magic carpet to heaven. But not Jesus. He did the full thing. He went all the way from the womb to the tomb to show that he wanted to be like unto us, to walk with the infirmities of a body that gets older, that gets weaker, that gets thirsty, that gets tired, that gets hungered, that cries, that has emotion, so that he could be a high priest that understands what we go through and pray and intercede for us. And so, so John says this, Paul says this. Now go to John in 1 John chapter 4. After Philippians, go a number of books to the right. After Hebrews, you see James and Peter. And then 1 John chapter 4. The Gnostics were out there. Oh yeah, Jesus, so oh, he was here, he was God, but it was just an angelic apparition. There was really no body and there was no flesh. And, and, and the writers are, are confirming to you that this is the God-man. Deity and humanity perfectly blended together. And John <laughs> tells you in 1 John, we'll read the first three verses of chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There's a lot of Gnostics telling you false things. I mean, when he talks about spirit and spirits, he's talking about what's being communicated to you, too. I mean, spirit, communication is a spiritual thing. He's saying, when you hear something communicated to you, when you hear a spirit of communication, try it. I mean, not everybody that speaks to you on God's behalf is really of God. A lot of people are false prophets. There's, there's Gnostics today out there. There are agnostics out there speaking. There's a lot of people. He's saying, watch for this thing. Verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. See? The Gnostics wouldn't confess that. He's saying, no, no. I'll tell you something, God, of God, God is telling you, yes, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He's telling you through the words of this Bible that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's a spirit come from God. When somebody tells you, yes, Jesus Christ was here physically, it's a physical reality. I, I read the craziest thing yesterday, <laughs> that they did a survey of 7,441 pastors in America. It was done in 1998. I left the results at home, I'll bring them in. But they did a survey of 7,441 Protestant pastors in the United States of America and asked them a question, was the resurrection an actual historical event? Did Jesus Christ actually die on a cross and was he resurrected? And I was amazed at how many said no. I was absolutely, I, I, the numbers, I have them at home, that range from something like 15% of one denomination to 51% of another denomination. 51% of the pastors in the pulpits of that Protestant denomination say, no, the resurrection was not a historical fact. Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He didn't die on the cross. He didn't go, beloved, try the spirits. <laughs> yeah, you better believe not every spirit. Just because someone's standing up there with a pulpit, you, you better test these things against the scriptures. He tells you every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Verse 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it's, it's not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already it's in the world. Not the physical Antichrist is in the world, but the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is that the Messiah never came which is why he'll show up to tell you he is the Messiah. And the spirit is that the Messiah never came physically. He never came. And John wants to let you know that the Word is the eternal Word, the creative Word, and the incarnate Word. The Word was made flesh. Now, it says he was made flesh. Go back to John 1. He was made flesh. There was a making process. Somehow the Lord fashioned this process. Amazing how God did this. Now, verse 18 of the same thing we're looking at. Notice verse 14, John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us. Then there's going to be a little parenthetical statement. And we beheld His glory, John saying. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Close parentheses. Full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. The Word was full of grace and truth. Verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. What he's saying here is he was made by the virgin birth to be the only begotten Son. Now the word beget, to beget is to sire or to procreate. 
or to produce something. He's the only begotten Son. Verse 18. Now it's interesting. This was a process by the, the virgin birth. When you read through Matthew, you read, you know, this guy beget, this guy, this guy beget, this guy, this guy beget. You go about 41 times, people begetting people. And then all of a sudden, it says, and Joseph, and it doesn't say Joseph beget Jesus. It says Joseph was the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born. Because Joseph did not beget Jesus. Who begat him? The father. Begotten of the father. The only begotten son. Now, this is being changed nowadays in, in a, a lot of uh, books, even things called Bibles. There's a Bible out there that calls him, instead of the only begotten son, calls him the one and only, with a capital O-N-E and a capital O-N-L-Y. The one and only. The one and only what? I mean, the one and only son, I'm assuming, because another one calls him the only son. But he's not the one and only son, and he's not the only son. How do I know that? I'm a son of God. As a matter of fact, look at verse uh, uh, 12 in the, in the very chapter we're in. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I'm a son of God. You're a son of God. We're all sons of God. The difference is we're not begotten sons of God. We're adopted sons of God. But we are one of God's sons. So he's not the one and only son of God. He's the only begotten son of God of God. The words are perfect here. To, to, to alter them anyway starts messing the doctrine up. And then I have to try and teach the doctrine without the words backing it up. But here the words just speak it. All I have to do is just state them. They come forth for it. He's the only begotten son. Another Bible I read, which was kind of crazy, said he's the only begotten God. The only begotten God in verse 18. Now, I don't know how you can be. The, you can't beget God. He's from everlasting. We already went through that. He's the eternal word in Micah. He's not a begotten God. As a matter of fact, go to 1 Timothy 3.16. Another verse that's changed, but let me just show you how important it is. When, when you don't change the verses and you let God speak, it, it, it's so easy to teach it because the words just state it clearly. I mean, you don't have to say to somebody, this is what the Bible teaches. You just open the King James Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. There, there it says it. See, it says it, black and white. It's not my interpretation of yours. It, it's saying it. See, it's saying the only begotten Son. 1 Timothy 3.16. Let me get there and catch up with you. <laughs> 1 Timothy 3.16. He says, and, and, and without controversy, and we'll just stop for a second because there's a lot of controversy today. Controversy is debate, disputing, opposition, resistance. God says, without controversy, don't dispute this, don't debate it. Great is the mystery of godliness. Say, I don't understand the Trinity. I don't understand the Godhead. He says, well, you don't have to argue about it. It's a great mystery. It's, it's going to be more than your finite mind can hold, but, but you can believe it, you see. And he's saying without uh, controversy, it's a great mystery, but let me just state it for you right here. Watch carefully, middle of verse 16. Who was manifest in the flesh? What does your King James Bible say? It says, God was manifest in the flesh. Capital G-O-D. You know what some other Bibles say? He was manifest in the flesh. That's an indefinite third person uh, singular pronoun. Who he? Well, Mike Caesar's been manifest in the flesh. I'm a he. What does that mean? It means nothing. Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. That's good too, and I'm glad he was. And John wants to get that. But here's what the Bible wants you to know. G-O-D was manifest in the flesh. See how perfect that is? And that's removed. Now, if God was manifest in the flesh, God existed before he was manifest in the flesh. To be, to be manifest is to openly reveal, to make plain, or to make open, to display, to publicly declare. So here, God wanted to declare himself and display himself and reveal himself in the flesh, but he existed before that. He's not a begotten God. He's not the only begotten God. He always was God. He's the only begotten Son who was God who manifests himself in the flesh for all of us. The eternal word, the creative word, the incarnate word. How did he do it? What was done by the virgin birth? Both Matthew and Luke. See, now John knows these Gospels were written. In Matthew 1 and in Luke chapter 1, it was revealed that, that God would take the, the power of the Most High and overshadow Mary and beget inside her womb, inside a virgin's womb, the one and only time it was ever done <laughs> that a virgin gave birth, a virgin woman human being gave birth to a human being was through Jesus Christ the only begotten son now the question is will you will you believe it 
See, God is stating his case. Then he's asking you, believest thou this? You know, the first to doubt the virgin birth was Mary. She said, how can these things be? And then God said, I'll tell you how it can be. He says, the power will overshadow you. Uh, with men, all you know, things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. Believest thou, Mary? And she said, be it according to thy word, unto thy handmaid. And she believed, and she received. And God says the same thing to you. Are you willing to believe that the eternal word, the creative word, was made flesh and became the incarnate word? That's the key. That's what's going to separate your belief, my faith, from the rest of the world, is that we believe that Jesus Christ was the God-man, not just a prophet, not just a teacher, not just a leader, not a martyr. He was the incarnate Word of God. This is what John wants to bring forth to us, the concept of the Godhead. Remember I told you earlier that the Word will be found in Scripture seven times? Now, you know who hates this doctrine more than anyone? The devil. The devil realizes if you get a hold of this doctrine, if you begin to recognize that... How are we doing on time, Joe? Beautiful. We'll finish this. If you get a hold of this doctrine, if you'll finally come to the realization that, that 2,000 years ago, God visited this planet. One of the reasons it's so beautiful. You see the astronauts taking pictures from space, and all the planets look like dead rocks and gas, gaseous balls. And then this one planet looks so beautiful and pretty, and it's got blue water and, and clouds and nice land masses with vegetation and green and an atmosphere of air so that beings can live on it. You say, why does God love Earth so much? Because he visited it. It's one of his favorite vacation spots. So, so, so he loves this place, you see, and he keeps it up. Now, if you can get a hold of that thing, then you'll recognize that Jesus Christ is worth following and taking as your Lord and Savior and Master. And the devil doesn't want you to get a hold of that thing. He's going to fight this thing every which way he can. I told you seven is kind of a, a number of completion, that God completes his work in the Bible. Now, we saw the word with a capital W was found four times in, in John's Gospel. We saw it in the first chapter four times. Now, it's going to be found three more times in the Bible. Let's go and work from the back forward. Go to Revelation, chapter 19. Revelation 19. This will be the fifth time we see it. See, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is associated with the Godhead. The Godhead is the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's the Godhead. That's the three in one that, that's just amazing to us. and just That's a doctrine no man could come up with. And, and the doctrine of the Godhead is, is a phenomenal thing. And, and the Word is intimately associated with that because He's part of the Godhead. So you're going to have the three. The Godhead's mentioned three times in Scripture. You're going to have the Word mentioned seven times. Three is the number of the Godhead. Seven is the number of completion. And here in Revelation 19, 13, we see, And He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. Now we know right away who this is. Who died for our sins? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's his garment of the blood that cleanses us from all sin. That's the only garment God will accept on us is when we have the righteousness of the robe of Jesus Christ on us. Our righteousness like filthy rags to God. So here's the word mentioned the fifth time. Now before the book of Revelation, a few books before it, there's an epistle called 1 John. And we'll find the sixth and the seventh mentioned. 1 John. Now in 1 John, verse, chapter 1 and verse 1, 1, 1. Here's the sixth mention of it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of, there it is, the word of life. He's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. He explains it in the third verse, the Son, Jesus Christ, last three words. He's talking about Jesus Christ. That's the word. There's the sixth mention. Now, the devil hates this. Now, if you've ever studied Bible numbers... Seven is the number of completion, right? You need that seventh time to complete it. You know where it's completed in this same gospel or this same little epistle. Go to the fifth chapter and the seventh verse, and here he's going to state the full Godhead with the seventh mentioning of the word. First John five seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Here they are: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. There they are. There's the strongest determination of the Godhead. And these three are one. There they are. Right there in the Scriptures. You say, how is it possible 
that 1 and 1 and 1 can equal 1. I'll tell, you how, I'll tell you how it's possible. Because down here, you and I are a creature that's kind of limited, and when we get together, we add things together. And adding is an interesting feature in mathematics that, that enlarges things. But you know what's more powerful than adding? Multiplying. And only God can multiply the loaves. And God can multiply. And 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. I mean, that's just from a mathematic term. God is able to do this. Again, the, the concept is... I think of Adrian Rogers said, think of your brain like, you know, being a quart, one quart in capacity. And the Godhead is like the Pacific Ocean. You just can't pour that whole thing and you don't have the capacity to get it. But you can believe it. And the Bible stating it, 1 John 5, 7, the strongest testimony we have to the Godhead right here in this verse. You know this verse is missing in all modern Bibles. It's been taken out of all modern Bibles. Think about that now. If you remove this one verse, what have you just removed? The Word. That's the seventh mention. That turns the word into number six. What's six? Six is just a man. Six is the number of man in the Bible. You know what the devil wants you to believe? Jesus was just a man. Just an ordinary man. In the devil's Bibles, he wants you to think Jesus was just another guy. Good guy. Follow him. Try and imitate his life. But you don't need to believe he was God. There's no Godhead. There's no Trinity. That's what the devil wants you to believe. You know what the book says? <laughs> You're wrong, Satan. Get thee behind me. The book says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God. It mentions him seven times in my Bible for me, and I know that that's God manifest in the flesh. This is a doctrine that the human mind could never discover on its own. This is a doctrine that had to be revealed by God, which is why God reveals himself to us. And he started his revelation with Moses at Sinai as he began to bring forth the Word with a small w. But when the time was full, in the fullness of time, he brought forth his son, made of a woman, the only begotten son of the Father, full of grace and truth, so that we could behold his glory and we could believe that Jesus is the Christ, both Lord and Christ, my God and my Lord. That's the purpose of this gospel. That's what we'll be studying. Next week we'll continue to see more of the words that John uses in the first chapter, the seven words he uses to bring forth Jesus to tell us that God has arrived. God is here. Any questions on what we studied this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the teaching and the, the plain, pure words written on the page of Scripture that reveal to us your love for us as you came and walked amongst us, lived for us, and then gave yourself for us, and then resurrected, Lord, to give us the hope and the power that we can have in your gospel. Thank you for Jesus. I pray you've encouraged us this morning and filled us with thy spirit. Help us to go out and be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. See if lovely, we, she had a song she wanted to sing.